We're so late. Okay. Well, he's not here, is he? No, he's not here. We're not on Morgan time today. We're on our time. It says I'm live, but I that could be a lie. I wouldn't put it past this system. Look at that. Look at that familiar group of faces. And some not so recent faces. So awesome to have everyone here for the final, for the ultimate show of 2016. I'm waiting for one human being to say hello to me that we know that it's happened. Ah, there's someone says we are live. We're live. It's live. Um, can someone give me some audio checks? Just uh, Nancy, can I hear you talk for one second? Hi, this is Nancy. That's pretty good. Uh, Paul, can I hear from you? No. Okay, good. Um, I think we're okay. Carolyn, let's hear from you. Oh, coming at you from 9,200 feet. That's great. Are you at 9,200 feet? Yes, 28, 18 meters. What, what are you doing cool. there? That's where I live. Wow. That's, that, does it take, does water boil at a lower temperature for you? At that, at that altitude? You know, I never pay attention. <laughs> it probably I'm going to say hi to a bunch of people here. Uh, hello to, here it goes, Brian Yoko, Carolyn B., Cloverfield 911, Douglas Crandall, Il Avron, Eric Knapp, Del Sabrin, Granville White, Guido Bibra, Helge Bierkog, Eric Bo Anderson, James Haney, James Whitman, Janelle, Jim Meeker, Joe Covernat, Coveras, uh, John Gallant, John Suffield, Malcolm Bond, Michael Jobin, Momo Dario, Nancy Graziano, Ocean McIntyre, Paul, Matt, In the Show Sutter, Roberto Sanchez, S. Wolberg, Sergio Botero, Shane Geary, Sylvan Westby, Space TV, Stephen Hawkins, Tech Tang, the astounding empiricist, Thomas Tranaker, Tom Van Scudder, and Zap Fan Zap Fan. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Uh, you got to remember, you got to say hello in the chat, and then I will uh, see your name, and I'll be able to say hello to you. So we'll start in, like five-ish minutes anyone got any uh plans oh one thing we're gonna do during the show it, depending on how much time we have um and i get to decide how much time we have so uh is we're gonna talk about some big stuff sort of our favorite big stories of uh 2016 so if uh you folks have some suggestions on what you think are some big stories in 2016 as we sort of approach that go ahead and post them that may jog our memory because I barely remember 2016. I'm really looking forward to it sort of passing behind us and moving on to 2017. But, um, I don't know. Someone wants to know what's behind you there, Paul. What is that? It's, uh, it's fancy artwork. I didn't pick it. I'm in an office at Cosi Science Center. This office features uh, some abstract non-science related art because, uh, because it does. <laughs> it's backed in pretty tight there. Yeah, it's the small conference room. Right, right. Is that the one that we we did the interview in? No. No, that was over at OSU campus. Uh, so this, uh, I'm at the Science Center today. Yeah. Um, and I know you're all excited to see that Nancy Atkinson's here, uh, but uh, but she's here to uh, promote her new book. So it's not just space news, but also shameless self promotion. Oh, I don't have my copy here. Oh, okay. You sent me a copy, but it's like upstairs. So that's fine. Um, all right, well, let's get uh, let's get started. I think I like the time ish. All right, uh, change that. I'll palm that center all the time. Just me. All right, here we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the weekly space hangout for Friday, December thirtieth. 2016, our ultimate show of 2016. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, and uh, this week we're going to be talking about uh, a lot of our fallen heroes who have passed away, uh, both in, I guess, science fiction and also actual science and space exploration. So it's kind of been a bad year. Uh, we're also going to be talking, we're going to do some more information on the anti-hydrogen and an ocean on series, and we'll also do a bit of a 
a year in review. We'll talk about some of the uh, the big stories of the year. Not necessarily exactly what happened, because of course, if you've been watching the Weekly Space Hangout, you know what's happened, but more just how it makes us feel and our sort of hopes for the for next year. So joining us this week, we've got, hmm, I'm gonna start with uh, Dr. Paul Metzetter. Hey, how's it going, Fraser? There you are. We got uh, Carolyn Peterson. Hi from the Colorado Rockies. And, and as we learned before, at incredibly high altitude. You're you're like halfway to space already. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. I have been most of my life, but yeah. <laughs> and uh, sometimes panelists, but also special guest this week, uh, University Today's senior editor, Nancy Atkinson. Nancy, welcome back. Hi, thanks. Great to be here. So we've got to sort of... So two agendas to have you here uh, this week, Nancy. We're going to be talking with, uh, you're going to join us a bit for the roundup on some of the stories, but also uh, you've got uh, a new book to promote. And I think we mentioned this a couple of, I guess, months ago, but uh, but here it is. Yeah. So here it is, Incredible Stories from Space, a behind-the-scenes look at the missions changing our view of the cosmos. Just out. Uh, how, how did this happen? How, how did you get a book? <laughs> well, um, about a well, a little over a year ago, a year and a few months ago, I got a call from Page Street Publishing. They are a subsidiary of Macmillan. And they were wondering if I'd be interested in writing a book about NASA's robotic space missions. They had this idea. They were just looking for somebody to, buy, to write it. And uh, to say that I was honored is an understatement that, uh, that they asked me. So... Yeah, it's uh, it's been quite a journey. I've uh, it's been a busy year, that's for sure. Well, and I think you know, if people who follow Universe Today might have noticed, there's a lot less material coming out of Nancy Atkinson this year. Uh, right. But there, but it was all happening. It was just happening into the book. Yep, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the book is uh, basically an in-depth look at uh, the missions to explore the solar system and beyond. You know, it looks at the technology and the science and the discoveries being made by all these missions. But what I really wanted to do with the book is to tell the human side of the missions, because while all these journeys that the spacecrafts are taking are really exciting and compelling, uh, really the stories of the humans behind the missions are are just as fascinating. So. Um, I feel really privileged that 37 NASA scientists and engineers shared their stories with me for the book. And uh, I, I really hope that I was able to convey their incredible dedication and enthusiasm for what they do. So, so um, who, who can we expect? What stories can we expect to see in the book? Well, um, uh, I started off with uh, the New Horizons mission. I got to talk to Alan Stern, Hal, uh, Hal Weaver, and Alice Bowman. And uh, yes, yeah, so, some of the people in the book are the, the larger than life people like Alan Stern and other people are, you know, kind of the behind the scenes people that you never hear from or hear about, but uh, they're equally as integral to the missions. Uh, Alan Stern, by the way, is going to be a guest of the Weekly Space Hangout uh, in February. So stay tuned. Yeah. So we'll get his side of the story about the, uh, the New Horizons. But Yeah, uh, so yeah, it was it was great to be able to talk to. Alan and uh, uh, people from the uh, well, the the list of the uh, the missions in the book are um, let's see, New Horizons, and then the Mars Curiosity rover, and then it's I'm um, trying to go in. If, you know, my my memory is so bad because it's once you write a book, your memory is gone. <laughs> anyway, okay, uh, Hubble Space Telescope. And then I did the Dawn spacecraft. That was really fun to talk to Mark Raymond. He is one of the most uh, enthusiastic and passionate people I've ever had the opportunity and pleasure to meet. Uh, then Kepler and also Cassini-Huygens and the Solar Dynamics Observatory and the uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and then the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And then for my final chapter, I did a uh, kind of a compilation of new and upcoming missions like uh, James Webb, um, OSIRIS-REx. And then I got to tour the um, uh, out at Goddard, there's a robotic facility out there, and the uh, Restore L mission is coming up uh, in 2019, and that's to go robotically fix satellites that are in Earth orbit, and that was really cool. So I talk about that as well. So you know, you really cut your teeth on on writing 
uh, news stories, news articles, uh, you know, not a lot of the, I mean, you don't, haven't had a chance to do a lot of the in-depth reporting. And, you know, as your publisher, I guess that's sort of, you know, that's, that's my fault, but that's also sort of the, 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 the way the, the game has to be played, which is that the news is coming fast and furious. We have to stay on top of it. We have to turn it around. If you're lucky, you get to make a, a phone call to one of the investigators and get some more information from them. And if you're unlucky, you know, you kind of have to, to sort of go on, on research. What was it like to, to have more time to be able to actually go places and talk to people and you know how is that process different than than just writing articles well the really great thing was that i got to go out to the jet propulsion laboratory goddard space site center the applied physics lab and then also to the um, space telescope science institute some of i mean those are just iconic places and i had the chance to talk to so many of the pretty much the top people in in a lot of these missions and that was very gratifying uh, very humbling to be able to talk to all those people. Um, yeah, it was just so amazing to, you know, talk to these people and have the chance to kind of get into their heads and sometimes into their hearts about the things that they were feeling during kind of crucial points in the mission. You know, the launch is always a crucial part. Uh, a lot of the missions, though, have had, you know, moments where you didn't know if the spacecraft was going to su survive, you know, like the Dawn mission and the reaction wheels going out and the Kepler mission and the reaction wheels really going out and they had to change the entire mission. So getting, um, you know, the, the inside stories of, of what people were feeling during those times was was really neat. And as I said, I hope I was able to kind of capture and convey those um, emotions and sometimes kind of existential feelings that the the people shared with me i think we get a bit of a of a glimpse of that here even on the weekly space hangout like it's one thing to take the press release that's come from nasa and try and you know try and explain the things that have happened you know we're able to do the what part but to be able to kind of get a little deeper and and really experience the emotions of the people, what they're going through as these events are happening. I mean, to, to be a part of the Kepler team when your spacecraft breaks down, to be a member of the New Horizons team when those first blurry images of Pluto come back. I mean, that's, you know, which is like in some cases a decade of, of work, right? Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. One of the, the uh, I, I really enjoyed being at JPL. I've really I've wanted to go there for a long time, and uh, one of the most memorable moments of being there was so I got to go into the room where, uh, if you remember from the Curiosity landing, where the EDL team, the Entry Descent Landing team, uh, were sitting there at the consoles, and you know Adam Steltzner pacing back and forth. Anyway, so um, I was standing in that room and the the guy who uh, helps run that facility out there, Jim McClure, he turned on the um, the trailer that NASA put together. So I was standing in the room watching the trailer of um, all, all these events taking place. It was just, it was just fine tingling. It was really cool. And then at, also at JPL is the, uh, the dark room where all the data comes in and goes out to the spacecraft through the deep space network. And that is just a cool room. I mean, it's huge. And they have this area where you can stand and just look over everything. There's not a lot of action going on there, but just to know that all the data is coming back from the spacecraft um, and going, and all the instructions are going out to the spacecraft there in that room is is pretty neat. Yeah, my, I mean, my experience with the Jet Propulsion Lab is that it's it feels like a university dorm room you know definitely yeah. feels like you're at a university campus and yeah it's just these yeah, sort of super old buildings and you wouldn't know that space is being explored from this from this location which was kind of amazing um but that uh you know if you do get a chance to go into some some of the very special rooms or you know you go into like the the back lot of jpl and like there's where they test the rovers and there's where they mm -hmm. build the spacecraft in that building there really is you can sort of really get a sense of it once you start to realize what's going on under the under the scenes so you had a chance to see jpl you were out at goddard uh where else did you get a chance to go the space telescope science institute that was just like Oh my gosh, that's also like, well, it is on a college campus, but you walk into this building and uh, you just can, the history is just like oozing out of the walls. It's just so amazing. But then also they're building the room uh, where all the, where all the 
uh, where, well, where they will run the James Webb telescope. So I got to see that room and it's just a, uh, it's just so iconic. And then of course that room, uh, the, the building is set in a very wooded area. So here you've got all this uh, rows and rows of high tech equipment being set up to, to run the uh, uh, James Webb telescope. And then you look out over this wooded area. It's just kind of a, a great combination of earth and space all together in one place. Now, did you get a chance to go outside the country? Did you get a chance to see some of the other facilities around the world? or No, unfortunately, my uh, my little travel budget <laughs> did not include going uh, anywhere but the U.S. And um, the publisher did want to kind of stick with NASA missions. But the thing about uh, about that is I still got to talk to people from other countries because all of the missions these days are basically international missions. You know, there's the... Um, you know, there's either a uh, an instrument that has been provided by one of the European ESA, ESA countries, or um, basically scientists from around the world work on all the missions. You know, like Dawn has uh, a lot of German scientists, and so I did end up talking to people from, from other countries. But um, yeah, on the whole, it was just NASA missions. Yeah. Uh, and so was there a place perhaps that you would have liked to have gotten a chance to spend more time at, but just because of the time involved, you didn't get a chance to really stick around? Well, I'd love to go All back to JPL. I mean, for one thing, I went there in January and I live in Minnesota and that was California. So that was pretty nice. But um, uh, yeah, I, it would, I'd, I'd love to go to NASA headquarters and just uh, tour that and talk to some of the people there. Um, you know, I'd love to go to all the all the NASA centers. Of course, I've been to Kennedy Space Center, um, and um, the only thing that really happens with the robotic missions is that some of them launch from Kennedy Space Center, so there's not a lot of uh, you know interaction there. But uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I'm I'm very grateful that I got to do the traveling and that I got to do and and uh, talk to the people that I talked to. Again, like I said, 37 people took times out, time out of their very busy lives and schedules to talk to me, so I'm very grateful. So there's, there's two kinds of people, in my opinion. There's people who've never written a book and people who will never write a book again. Um, where do you stand on that, on that front now, now that you've gone well, through the process of writing a book? Yeah, I'm, I'm still in recovery, mm -hmm. but <laughs> no, I, I think I would. It was um, it was really kind of an exhilarating experience to to be able to travel to these places and talk to all these people. And um, and like I said, I really did want to highlight the people behind the missions because they're they're just so amazing. And and I did not have one iffy, you know, person. They were all like really excited to tell their stories. And I think. You know, they they all know that they're doing something in their lives and in their work that not very many people get to do. So they were very willing to share their experiences and, like I said, some of their feelings that they had while some of these events were going on. So I think, you know, they, they know that, um, well, for one thing, they're on the taxpayer dime. But another thing is that, you know, uh, they wanted to share what it's like to do these things because not very many people get to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so why don't you uh, let's let's see a copy of the book again, and where can we uh, where can we pick one up? Um, you can get it at um, all the online places: uh, Bar Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million. Um, I even saw that it's at. Uh, you can order it on Target.com. I, I know a few stores in Minnesota have it because um, that's where I live, and I'll be doing some local events here in Minnesota. Um, and but yeah, you, know, you know, if you want to buy it in a store, go to your store and say, "Hey, I want to buy this here," and they'll probably order it. So, barn like a Barnes and Noble. That's uh, that's fantastic. Well, congratulations, Nancy, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see a little more of you in in 2017. Now that you get your time back. Yeah, I hope so too. That would be great. Wonderful. Uh, and of course, if anyone wants to follow you out there on the internet, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at Nancy underscore A. Facebook, I'm Nancy Atkinson. And uh, I'm on Instagram, too. I think I'm Nancy UT. 
because Nancy A was taken. So Nancy, <laughs> right, Nancy, okay. Nancy Universe today. Awesome. Well, you know, for I hope I speak for for everybody here. Congratulations on uh, going through this process, writing a book, getting a chance to talk to a bunch of our collective heroes, and I know that we'll all get a chance to kind of uh, meet them and hang out with them through your stories. So, so thanks a lot for uh, going through the process for us. Well, thanks. I have to say thanks to you, Fraser, for giving me a shot all those years ago. Uh, 2004, I've been working with you. So it's been an amazing ride, and I hope it continues for a long time. And like I said, I have to send a lot of the thanks to you. No problem. Hey, uh, anyone who, anyone else want a book deal? Just let me know. Uh, <laughs> I don't like I had anything to do with it. Uh, all right, well, let's move on uh, to some of the stories uh, that we had this, this uh, I guess, this last week, and then we will uh, spend more time and talk about, uh, uh, sort of look back over the last year, and then kind of we might be excited about this year. So uh, first, uh, Carolyn, let's talk about some, some people who we lost this year. Right. So before I start that, I want to say, Nancy, I'm also in recovery, but I'm also working on another book. So I'll be six months behind you in recovery. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, yeah, so this week was a little rough if you were following your space heroes. And the first one uh, that I really got a lot of notice about was, was Vera Rubin. And I did write a, a, an article about her. And I had also written a chapter in one of my books about her. Because when I was first in school, we heard a little bit about dark matter, but not, you know, what it was or what, we had a lot of speculation. And we didn't really hear a lot about the woman behind all of the observations. So I had a chance to meet her at a meeting, and I described that on my blog entry. And she was there listening to my talk, which had nothing to do with dark matter. It was more about uh, astronomy outreach and comets and amateur observers. And afterwards, she took me out and we got coffee, and she asked me a lot about what I was doing. And I was just amazed that this woman was actually talking to me because she's kind of one of my heroes at the time. And, and so we kept up. You know, over the years, we'd run into each other at meetings, and she'd ask how I was doing, and I'd ask how she was doing. So there was a personal connection there. So when she died, I was a little surprised that I hadn't heard from her in a while. I had written to her about a couple of projects that we were working on, didn't hear anything, and I heard that her, her health was not good. So got that message and immediately started to write about her. I mean, it was a big loss. The next day, Carrie Fisher died. Now, Carrie didn't discover dark matter or anything like that, but she's understandably a big hero to a lot of people who were in the Star Trek universe. Star, Star Wars universe, but also because she was such a strong woman. So it's like two strong women in a row dying. And, and I really felt like I needed to, to, to respond to that. And, and so that's what I did. And so we also had the loss of astronaut Peter Sellers, who if you read his final words to people, he really, you know, does not want us to stop exploring and do not, you know, don't stop what you're doing. Um, and, I mean, throughout the year, we've lost people. John Glenn, that was yeah. a huge that was a huge one for me because I remember watching him when I was a kid, watching him do all those things, finally met him once. And, you know, you expect these heroes to be larger than life. They turn out to be these very ordinary, humble people most of the time. And that's what a lot of people were saying about, about both Vera Rubin and John Glenn. Is John Glenn sort of went off to become a politician, but he seemed to be one with a heart and a soul that, that you know, didn't quit. And took another crack at being an astronaut later on in his career, which yeah, is so amazing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he, yeah. he helped, you know, he was, what, the first American to orbit planet Earth, but then came back around to be the oldest person to go to space and participate in space mission. So, Well, and leverage that because we didn't really know how elderly people would do in space. Now, speaking as someone who expected to be living on the moon by now, um, you know, I'm sort of, you know, that sort of gave me hope that maybe there's a place in space for all of us, no matter what our age is. Yeah, yeah. So, it's. I mean, apparently, according I think it was according to the BBC, this actually has been a bad year for for deaths and celebrity deaths, and I'm you know I guess deaths in the in the scientific uh, group as well. Uh, people in the chat are mentioning that, of course, Ziggy Stardust passed away this year as well. David Bowie, well, Prince. I mean, a, a lot of people. It. it and, and when I wrote when I wrote my first article about um, about Vera Rubin a few days ago, one of my colleagues from the university contacted me and said, well, the reason that this is affecting us all is we're at an age now where all of our heroes and mentors are now passing on and we're having to look at that. We're now taking on that torch. You know, those of us who were, you know, went through graduate school in our 20s and 30s and 40s, and now those people who helped us are moving on and now it's our turn. 
hopefully. But but the thing is, the range of the people, uh, the age range of the people who are passing away is so mm-hmm. wide. I mean, like well, people like Prince to people like Vera Rubin, or you know, it, it's it's a long, it's a wide range of years. So yeah, but and in many different uh, area endeavors too, and they all accomplished amazing things. I mean, David Bowie. Well, I couldn't even listen to Chris Hadfield sing for a while after that one. That was tough. Yeah. Uh, well, let's let's all hope that uh, 2017 is a lot uh, goes a lot easier on uh, on all the the people that we care about in uh, the real world and also the uh, I guess in the scientific world and in the entertainment world. Let's uh, let's hope for a better 2017 than yeah, we had. For I hope it does too. I, I'm a lot of us who um, really got interested in space got it because of John Glenn and. You know, everything from, from, you know, the original, you know, Apollo astronauts and the Gemini astronauts and the Mercury 7 going up all the way to people that grew up learning about space by because they were inspired by movies or Star Trek or 2001 or Star Wars. You talk to people who are in astronomy and in space science, and a lot of times you do hear, oh, I saw this great movie or I saw this television show. And so those people become your heroes as well, too, even though they didn't go out to space. You know, William Shatner didn't go to space, but he became your hero. Yeah. All right, let's uh, let's move on. Uh, now I'm just getting sad. Uh, oh, Paul no. Sutter, let's uh, let's again. yeah, let's come back around and uh, and talk a bit more about uh, anti hydrogen. So we we covered it a bit last week, but why don't you uh, sort of bring us up to speed? We're going to have a, an astrophysicist go deep on this one. Yeah, the reason we're so interested in making and studying anti particles and anti hydrogen is there is this very big mystery in our universe. According to all of our standard models of particle physics, just the way the universe operates, antimatter and regular matter uh, are pretty much exactly the same. If there's some sort of physical process that happens at a fundamental level, it will produce antiparticles just as normally as it will produce normal particles. So the question is, where's all the antimatter in the universe? We look out in the universe and it's pretty much all normal matter. So something had to happen in the very, very early universe that caused an asymmetry where the production rates of normal matter and antimatter in the very hot soup of the early Big Bang, something happened to produce more normal matter than antimatter. So, and, but we have no idea what, oh, okay, we have some ideas what, but they're just kind of guesses. And so the more antimatter we can make, the more anti-hydrogen we can make, the more we can study it, we can look to see if there are any little differences. And these recent results from CERN, where they were able to make a bunch of anti-hydrogen atoms, they held on to them for about 10 minutes and they shot lasers at them and they looked at the emission of the light that was absorbed by the anti-hydrogen and then uh, 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 shot off again by that same anti-hydrogen. So just like you would with normal hydrogen spectroscopy, except with anti-hydrogen. And according to our standard model of particle physics, that light that comes off of anti-hydrogen should look exactly the same as normal hydrogen and it turns out it does up to some incredibly ridiculous level of precision. So this is both good news and bad news. The good news is that our standard model of physics uh, looks pretty much correct because our standard model says anti-hydrogen ought to be exactly the same or act exactly the same as normal hydrogen, but it's bad news because it doesn't give us any clues as to what the heck went on in the early universe. Well, that was my next question. What the heck went on in the early universe? But obviously, you don't know, so that doesn't really help. Some. Yeah, yeah. There's lots of papers about it, trust me. But (laughs) uh, it's it's all super vague. We're not exactly sure what's going on. It's something beyond the standard model. And we had a chance to talk about this quite a bit with with Sandy. I had a couple of questions that I, I know were sort of out of her realm of expertise. What questions does that leave us with about antimatter? I know one of the questions was like, does antimatter maybe have anti-gravity? Is that still an un- un- unknown? No, by definition. Oh, uh, 
Okay, by definition, the only thing different about antimatter is the charge. So it has the same weight, has the same magnetic moment, has the same spin, has same, 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 except for the charge. And so if you were to have a ball of matter and a ball of antimatter and you were to drop them, they would fall to the floor at the same rate. The, that experiment is a little bit hard to do. There have been some studies, and as far as we know, uh, antimatter behaves the exact same way under gravi gravity. Uh, so it's not like they have anti-mass or negative mass or anything like that. And as predicted by our theories, the only thing different is, is the charge. Uh, they behave Otherwise, they behave totally normally. And as far as we can tell in all our experiments, that's exactly what they do. Right. So, so that's it then. There was the last question was the spectra and, and apart from where did it all go? Uh, it seems to fulfill the, the expectations. Yeah. Yeah. So now that we have the spectra, uh, we, we have the spectrum from one atomic transition line. Uh, we don't have spectra from other transitions, other kinds of light that hydrogen can give off or anti-hydrogen can give off. So we're going to study those. And really now the question is, what happens to antimatter versus normal matter in very complicated interactions, uh, like what's happening inside of these high energy colliders? Just looking for anything that could be a little bit different that points the way to some new physics. So do you have your best, your favorite theory? I always like to know your favorite theories on various things. So what's your favorite theory on what happened to all the antimatter? You know, there is some speculation, and I stress the word speculation, that it has something to do with the dark matter particle. That in the very, very early universe, things were very, very dense. There were a lot of dark matter particles floating around. And even though they don't interact with normal matter most of the time, we suspect that every once in a while, a little dark matter particle, whatever it is, does interact with normal matter. So maybe there's some connection where the inter interaction of dark matter with normal matter may be favored or created an annihilation channel for antimatter that didn't respond to normal matter. And so I just kind of like that idea because it's maybe it, it takes two things that we totally don't understand and just puts them in one box. And if you solve that one thing, you, you get answers to both. But that's totally speculative. Right. But the, but the fact that it's weird that we've got dark matter and it's weird that we have mostly regular matter and not antimatter. Yeah, so both of these problems point to physics beyond the standard model. Dark matter does not fit in our standard model. If we figure that out, we get to extend our knowledge of physics. The matter and antimatter asymmetry in our universe does not fit in the standard model. If we figure it out, it points to new physics. Maybe that new physics is connected, maybe not. All right. Well, then we'll uh, hopefully more information will come out. Uh, now, you've got Sorry. one other story as well, which is the uh, ocean of Ceres. Yes, which is not made of antimatter, no. it's normal matter. Uh, so the Dawn spacecraft was doing some observing of Ceres, which is its mission. And it noticed some extra hydrogen in the northern polar region. And this hydrogen kind of layer or deposit was very uniform and very broad. And really, the only way that we know of to get that uniform of a layer of hydrogen in the, the soil or the, the crust of Ceres is if there was a surface ocean on Ceres a long time ago. So we think long time ago, back when Ceres was first forming, it was super hot, maybe still had a molten core. It was warm enough to liquefy any ices that would have accumulated on that uh, dwarf planet and actually create a temporary surface ocean. Eventually that ocean evaporated or froze. There still might be a frozen subsurface or a partially frozen, partially liquefied uh, subsurface surface water layer. We're not 100% sure on that, but these observations show that back in the day, Ceres was a very uh, wet place. Now, Ceres, of course, is on the 
Uh, I'm trying to remember here. It's on the on the outside of the frost line, right? Yes. The part of the of this order on the inside of the the frost line. Anyway, the place. Right. So it doesn't have water and ice on it because right. It's Just, yeah, it cooled off a long time ago and yeah. it too far from the sun. Uh, but like examples like Europa and Enceladus, you can be very far away from the frost line and still have liquid water if there's some other way to generate heat. And back then, just the heat from the formation of Ceres itself was enough to keep things liquid. And the, and the thinking really seems to be now that almost any object in the solar system that has water of any substantial amount has some amount of it that is liquid. I mean, they're now starting to even think that Pluto, Eris, Sedna, all of these worlds might it's have nuts. vast oceans underneath, which of course then means another place to go look for life. So yeah, it turns out Earth is unique, not in the fact that we have liquid water, but in the fact that we have liquid water on our surface. But the liquid water really is is everywhere. And so it's just another place to go mm -hmm. looking, another place to send a lander, and uh, perhaps a rover. If you're thirsty, uh, the solar system's got your back. <laughs> I am thirsty. <laughs> um, so we've got a couple of questions here. Uh, just a bunch of people wanted to have had some questions about the the antimatter. So I'm going to throw some of these your way first. Go for it. Uh, yeah. So uh, this comes from Giselle Sabarin. Since light is the same, could there be antimatter galaxies far away that we could see? We don't think so because even a galaxy isn't totally isolated. There is streams of gas and dust that are constantly collecting onto galaxies. Galaxies interact with each other over the course of billions of years. Even when we look out in the voids and we look at isolated dwarf galaxies, they're not really alone. If you look at, say, the distribution of just hydrogen in our universe, there might be a galaxy over here, but attached to that galaxy are streams of hydrogen that are continually falling onto that. So if we had a hypothetical antimatter galaxy, it would have detonated a long, long time ago. We would at least see the, the material, the regular matter, encountering it and... And it would look flashing awesome. and causing all of these explosions. So, it looks so cool. Uh, unless it is anti gravity and then it would be pushing away the, the regular matter particles. Uh, things would, I wouldn't say anti gravity. Uh, there is this concept of negative mass, but negative mass is a whole other can of worms. It, and it doesn't just repel things, it can repel or attract things depending on. It's just complicated. But is that how we get our anti-gravity so we can fly around the universe and stand on the deck? Yeah, anti-gravity is not a thing, so right. that's not how we're going to get it. All right. Uh, okay, so let's uh, – so so what I want to do now is we've got a uh, – Nancy actually shared before the show a bunch of her top stories of the year. And I want to talk about, you know, give each each of our panelists a chance to sort of introduce the the topic of, sort of what they thought was sort of one of the really big stories of the year and just kind of how it makes you feel, uh, you know, because obviously we all of these stories were so big, we covered them in depth. But, well, let's uh, let's do this. So and Nancy, since these this was your list, I'm going to let you pick one story from it that you really felt, uh, you know, was super important for 2016. Oh, I think I want to talk about SpaceX uh, because it, they had kind of an up and down year. So they, uh, <laughs> 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 I, yeah, that was that was intentional. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, they had some really great things happen this year. Like uh, back in May, they uh, they launched, and then they've been trying to land uh, the 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 first stage of the Falcon 9 rocket on a barge for couple of years i think they've tried five different times and finally in may they landed the 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 first stage back on on the barge successfully and it was just it was one of the most fun things to watch about that was when they turned the camera around and 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 showed the people at the spacex uh uh control room and how just how absolutely crazy they went that was cool but yeah one of the best headlines i saw was spacex landed a freaking rocket on a boat in the dark you know so it was uh that was pretty cool but then um then in july they had the successful launch of uh the dragon capsule to the international space station 
And then they, uh, you know, following that launch, they landed on land back at Kennedy Space Center, the, uh, uh, the Falcon 9 first stage. So that was pretty exciting. But then, let's see, when was it? I think it was in uh, late, September. Late August, early September. Late August, yeah. yeah. So they, they were doing a, uh, 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 some tests on the launch pad and the, and the rocket blew up. So they haven't launched since then because one thing, they were trying to figure out what happened. Uh, I don't know that they've really nailed it down for sure, but I, they're pretty sure that, uh, that it was a, a breach in the second stage helium system. But uh, um, I think they're still working on that. But anyway, uh, they're, they were hoping to get a launch underway before the end of the year, but uh, they just announced recently that it's not going to be until January. So, But another thing that they um, lo- announced this year was that um, – they're going to have a first crewed dragon flight to the International Space Station in 2018. So that's that's exciting. That's that's really cool. And that makes my heart feel happy about the future of space exploration. And uh, we all know that it's SpaceX. So that that's good news. Well, and of course, the other huge piece of news this year was the uh, was the announcement of the plans to, on how we're going to colonize Mars, which Right. Which was where, I mean, Elon Musk delivered us space nerd Christmas times a hundred thousand. Uh, and now all of our hopes and dreams and expectations rest firmly on his uh, on his shoulders. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's it's cool that somebody it's wonderful that somebody has this kind of vision to do these things because we really need it. And who knows what uh, the direction of NASA will go now with a new administration uh, if he on funding for various things. So we'll just have to see how things play out. But yeah, I think definitely um, uh, Elon Musk makes makes it all exciting. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, and I, I mean, I really feel that way, like th- that it really is our sort of Christmas, um, all, all of the holidays all, all put together. But it's this thing that we've been, we've been hoping and all the people I hope who watch this show have are so excited about the exploration of space and they just can't wait for 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 what happens in the future. We want to we want to jump forward like a hundred years to see what the future of, of exploration is going to be. And we have to wait and go through the, the ups and downs and the trials and the tribulations and the and the defunding of projects and the explosions on the launch pad and all that kind of stuff when, when what we want is we want to see a you know humanity's bold and glorious uh, future colonizing the entire space station. It's sort of there in our minds, but it's it's just not there in reality yet. And yet Elon Musk is is like, I think we can do it too. And here's all the ways that I'm going to do it. It all sounds kind of right. But of course, the downside of, of taking all of those hopes and dreams about the future in space exploration is that if it goes wrong and if perhaps things are delivered late or if there are horrible disasters, it's going to hit so much harder. Yeah. Well, I, you know, in my entire life, getting to Mars has always been 20 years off, 20 years off, no matter what it is. I think Carolyn mentioned that before we went live that, you know, we all thought we'd be on the on the moon by now or living on the moon have the option to live on the moon but uh yeah so it's it's going to come eventually it's just uh how many more 20 years is it going to well the no gonna... no now uh the red dragon is going to go in 2018 and then the first human colonists are going to be sent in 2024 we are we are just six years away now and there's nothing is going to delay this or stop this or change this we saw the presentation we've seen the science we know this is going to happen Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh. <laughs> oh. Ouch. I'll I will try I will try to embrace your enthusiasm, Fraser. No, my enthusiasm is muted. But I I I feel like in general Elon Musk does what he says he's gonna do, he just does it late. So Yeah, but so and f- that's just a, a a factor of how hard it is. It's it's if I mean if it was easy it would have been done by now and it but it takes a real visionary to just uh, step out like he has and uh, to at least make the attempt. Yeah. So this is yeah. going to be, it's going to be great to watch. I'm going to, I'm not going to retire anytime soon because I want to be covering this. Carolyn, give me your, yes. uh, what's the story that sort of made a big impact for you and, and your thinking and sort of feelings about uh, space over uh, 2016? 
Well, there's two. I mean, aside from Mars, that's just a continuum. I always am interested in that. Uh, the first one that really grabbed my attention this year was Juno and the arrival at Jupiter and the fact that we're going back to this gas giant planet that we saw first up close back in the, uh, what, late 70s, early 80s. So that, you know, really grabbed my attention. And I watched that mission get closer and closer and closer and then finally get there. And yeah, they're facing challenges. And so those challenges are things that they're working through with the effect on the spacecraft, but the data are coming in and they're, they're getting a better look at, at the planet. The other one that I've been tracking is Cassini mission. And, and that one is coming to an end at the end of 2017. So we still have plenty of good science coming. But in the last few weeks, I've just been astonished at the gorgeous images of the rings. You know, the rings of Saturn really keep everybody fascinated. You know, we like Titan, we like Enceladus, we like all the things that are happening, but those rings continue to grab your attention. And the best images of the last couple of, what, three weeks or so have been so up close, you feel like you could almost reach out and grab a particle, which, so that really is what's fascinated me and will continue to fascinate me through to the next year. I think it comes to an end in September, something like that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so I guess that's going to be a big story that we'll be all sad about and, and weepy next year is is when Cassini wraps up. But Juno, I want to go back to the Juno story because I think that that you're exactly right. This is a planet that that dominates the solar system and dominates the night sky. That if you look up in the night sky and you're seeing a bright star. You're looking at Jupiter, probably, uh, uh, apart Venus, from the sun, yeah. obviously. Uh, but, yeah. you know, in the night sky, you're seeing a bright star. That's mostly Jupiter because Venus is only, you know, doesn't spend a lot of time really bright in our sky. And yet, we have not had an operational spacecraft taking good, close pictures of it, what, since Galileo? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, New Horizons took one, but yeah, know, it took one picture as it, yeah, you know, took a couple yeah. of pictures as it went by and gave us a little taste yeah. of what of what modern imagery in a modern spacecraft can do. But it really yeah. hasn't been; it's been so long since we've been up and close, and yet we see what Cassini is doing at Saturn and just mm-hmm. taking everything to the next level. We've learned so much about Saturn, and yet here is Jupiter with its with its worlds like Europa and. Mm-hmm. Um, and Io and and all of the the small well, look, and look it has at the images that are coming out that are the really high resolution of, of just features in in the atmosphere, you know the polar around the poles. So you know we were used to seeing sort of big storms and 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 of course the great red spot, but now we're zeroing in on smaller and smaller storms. We don't really still understand that entire atmosphere as well as we could. So those kinds of images over a long time period and, and the most important part here one of the most important parts is you want to get images over a long time period snapshots don't give you the whole science story so here we are getting them over a long time period of what 17 18 long orbits that we can do yeah and and of course uh, you know europa as the best place that we could be looking for evidence of life in the in the solar system you know with its large almost certain liquid oceans Mm -hmm. Who knows what shenanigans evolution has gotten up to underneath the surface of that ice, and so there is a whole nother class of spacecraft that's going to be going back. The you know the upcoming Europa mission, right. I know the stuff the Europeans have stuff in the works as well. But it's it's heartbreaking to me. It had been heartbreaking to me that there was no exploration of Jupiter and its moons for so long, and now here we are. There is an operational spacecraft. It made it. It's safe. It's taking pictures. They're great get ready for a lot more of just analysis from Ju- from Jupiter, which is something that we, yeah. you know, we really need. Well, and the other, thing, the other thing, too, is that when you take a look at this mission and what it's accomplishing, we still need more data about what it's going to take to get our next spacecraft, I forget what the Europa spacecraft, to Europa, the conditions it's going to face. You know, we know sort of generally the magnetosphere, we know what the radiation hazards are going to be. What else do we need to know that we can get from this mission now to inform that next mission as we're building it and planning it? Yeah, yeah. Paul Matt Sutter. Hey. Let me guess. Something about uh, gravitational waves? You're a good guesser, Fraser, because we talked about it before the show. Went yeah, on. that's true. Yeah, you're a really good guesser. Yeah, gravitational waves. Uh, technically discovered in... 2015 but not announced until early this year because they wanted to double check and actually be good scientists and make sure because it's kind of a big deal they've been looking for them for what 25 years 
speakers, getting ever more precise and understanding their noise properties more and more and more. And finally honing in on after they did an upgrade to their instrument and they weren't, this is the coolest part, they weren't even expecting a signal yet. They still thought they were another few years out from the signal. It just so happens that they caught a signal at just the right time from two really big black holes. Uh, I think one was 30 solar masses and another was 40 or 50 solar masses. We didn't expect those kinds of black holes, those sizes to be very, very common. So we just, we just didn't expect a signal in that kind of range. But then as soon as we turned on the sucker with uh, advanced LIGO with it upgraded and everything, um, we saw a signal. So yay, we got a signal, but now we have a huge puzzle. Uh, how exactly does the universe produce black holes of that size so commonly that we're able to see it so easily? And the size of these black holes, right, was in that intermediate range. They were in the dozens of times mm -hmm. the mass of the sun, which is exactly the kind of mass of black hole that astronomers have had a really hard time finding with all of their other observational techniques when in theory that that middle range size they should be out there in the parts yeah of, or, or, or we had star clusters things we, like that we make uh star uh, solar mass black holes a few times bigger than the sun but then we thought maybe once black holes start merging the merging goes crazy and you'll end up uh, with the big supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies that these kind of intermediate range from dozens of solar masses to thousands of solar masses. Uh-oh. Looks like we lost Paul's uh, feed. The rest of you are still here? Yes. Yep. All right. All right. I'll uh, give him a second to return. Let's see if there's any questions that we had. Um, so here's a question that comes from Cecil Morgan. How do you have liquid water on the surface uh, without an atmosphere? So you actually um, can't have, well, you can have liquid water on the surface with uh, as long as the gravity and the temperature are fine. So, but the problem with places like uh, Mars, for example, that could theoretically have the right temperature in places and at times is that the gravity is so low and there is a lack of atmosphere that the, the solar radiation from the sun sort of blows away the hydrogen and the water out into deep space. And so, so over the billions of years, because uh, Mars didn't have its own magnetosphere to protect its atmosphere and its water, the solar radiation is just kind of blew it away off into space. And so that's the reason why you can't. So if you have a world that has liquid water on the surface of it and an atmosphere, but that is exposed to the radiation of the sun without some kind of protective magnetosphere like the Earth has, it's just going to go away over time. So this is this is why we're, we look for it sort of enclosed under a shell of ice. Those are the only places really that are left that could have uh, some kind of liquid water here in the solar system. Once you lose, once you've got your your liquid water on the surface, it's it's gone. Uh, someone was asking about uh, astronomy cast. Yes, we're doing astronomy cast shortly after this. So stick around uh, over on the astronomy cast channel. We'll do a live show today. We're doing the volcanoes of Mars. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Metzetter, before you so rudely uh, destroyed yeah, sorry about that. what happened? A uh, rogue gravitational wave. Rogue gravitational wave. Yeah, sort of my connection is all. No big deal. I know, right? Uh, anyway, gravitational waves, big deal, lots more mysteries, uh, Nobel Prize around the corner, I'm sure of it, not for me, but for the LIGO team, and, uh, and more science to do. I mean, I've sort of mentioned this a few times that really the, the great thing about gravitational waves is it gives us this ability to look in the places that are completely hidden to all of other methods. You can theoretically peer within the event horizon of a black hole. You can see beyond the cosmic microwave background radiation to the places that were even earlier. And this was, of course, that search for primordial gravitational waves. So, so do you think that over the next decades, 
gravitational waves will be used as a tool for astronomy, more than just using it to confirm Einstein's theories, will it be used as an observational tool to, to help understand yeah. the universe better? Uh, even with this first uh, discovery, and then they've had two uh, follow-up confirmed discoveries, already it's being used as an observational tool. Already we're understanding black hole merger processes is in a way that we would never be able to before with just astronomy based on the electromagnetic spectrum. So gravitational waves are up there with neutrino astronomy, where it's using different probes to access uh, parts of our universe, like the interior of a star as it's going supernova, or black holes as they're beginning to merge, or earlier in our universe than the formation of the cosmic microwave background. It's giving us probes, ways to access those parts of the universe that we simply can't through electromagnetic radiation. So it's, it's a whole, it will eventually grow into an, its own branch of astronomy. Yeah, I kind of imagine things like, and you know, maybe my astrophysics is a little weak on this, right? Which is like one of the questions we don't still even know what's inside the event horizon of the black hole. Is is the black hole itself, you know, right there of some size, or is it infinitely small and and getting compressing forever? And so, but could the way two black holes potentially come together, the way they collide and the way they release those gravitational waves? I mean, could you end up with, say, black holes spiraling within their collective event horizon, which would tell you that maybe there's some kind of size inside there, things like that? If you're moments. just following, uh, say, uh, strict general relativity, I think not even gra gravitational waves can... Uh, tell you anything about the interior of a static black hole inside of its event horizon. Uh, but the merger process is depends on some very complicated and very deep uh, cal calculations in general relativity. And looking in detail at these gravitational wave signatures compared to what we theoretically predict, this might open the door to understanding things like quantum gravity. If we can find any hint whatsoever that general relativity is wrong, then uh, like it is with the dark matter problem or the matter-antimatter asymmetry problem, it's a, it's a doorway into understanding new physics. So by comparing those detailed observations uh, to the, our very detailed theoretical calculations, maybe we'll learn something. And the next step, of course, is, is to take the analysis to the next level. We've only really begun with what the sensitivity of the instruments that we can build by having yeah. something that's ground-based. You put that out in space, you separate your spacecraft and you can take the sensitivity to the next level. The kinds of events that this can just barely discover could be commonplace. Right, and not just sensitivity, but also wavelength. So any ground-based detector based on the maximum distance you can put two of your detectors in your interferometer, you can only see a certain kind of event. You can only see black holes merging of a certain mass. You can only see but to a certain distance. You put interferometers in space with very, very long wave uh, baselines, you can see very long wavelength events, like say primordial gravitational waves from the very early universe. Yeah, so it's a good year. Nobel prizes for everyone. Except for me. You've just gotta discover something. Like you just answer, just answer where all the antimatter went and you should be all right. Yeah, I'll work on that. Awesome. Um, okay, great. Well, I think we're sort of reaching the end of our of our time here, both for this show and for this this year. Uh, I've got a little bit of uh, some work to do here first. I want to remind everybody a big thanks to our partnership with the WSH crew. This is, of course, the weekly space hangout crew. Uh, they choose our guests. Like, I don't know if people really understand how this works, but but I am just the person that does the interviews. There's this whole community of people, the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They organize a lot of the stories that we're going to be talking about. They organize the guests. They are really the executive producers of this show. And so if there are guests that you want, you know, if you want us to talk to some of your space heroes, join the WSH crew. 
participate in this community, suggest people to, to invite our, our list of guests for 2017, you know, it's still pretty wide open right now. So let us know who you'd like us to talk to and, you know, even help out and just like reach out to people, tell them that you're the executive producer. Anyway, there's instructions on the WSH crew. And I just want to let you know, this is more than just a community. They are literally a partnership. We are like some kind of symbiotic creature that uh that it you know reaches out and interviews luminaries in space and astronomy and you can be a part of this so uh, go the i think they've got a new domain name wsh crew uh dot space which is awesome and there's instructions i just went through on how you can actually join the uh, the conversation here so that's the first thing a huge thank you to all of them to to nancy graziano and to all the the folks on the team that did this we had a great year and i really look forward to to cranking this up to the to the <sighs> next level next year uh big thanks to all of both our guests and all of our panelists over the course of the year it was awesome and amazing to to talk to you i know this is coming out of your personal time and it was absolutely wonderful to be able to share this time with you big thanks to all the fans who who watch the show uh week after week after week live as well as those of you who who listen on the podcast and and watch the show after the fact we again we do this for you so uh uh, it's an honor to be able to do this. The last thing, one sort of special guest, uh, so one gift, sorry, that we've got for you is uh, probably tomorrow we're going to be announcing or we're going to be releasing, uh, in addition to books, uh, Dave Dickinson, who is a regular panelist on the show, his 2017 Observing Guide, 101 Objects to See, 101 Events for 2017. We are releasing the book for free. Uh, free PDF. Everybody can download it. Go crazy. Uh, this is going to be going out probably uh, tomorrow afternoon. We'll be releasing it to you. So uh, we'll sort of make that a lot more widely available. So hopefully that uh, won't be the last time that Dave Dickinson does this. Um, all right. So I think that's it. Thanks to everyone for joining us this week. Uh, Paul Matt Sutter, where can people find out more? They can follow me on Twitter and Facebook at Paul Matt Sutter. Also my website pmsutter.com has links to all of my stuff and activities including my own podcast ask a spaceman where you can check out more at askaspaceman.com how convenient is that and you can also help uh, contribute to that show after you've contributed to fraser kane you've got a couple extra bucks you go to patreon.com slash pm sutter fantastic uh carolyn collins peterson where do people find out more you can read me on thespacewriter.com. I'm on Twitter at, at spacewriter. And I also write and edit for spaceabout.com. Wonderful. And uh, Nancy Atkinson, where do people find out more? Nancy underscore A at Twitter, Nancy Atkinson on Facebook. I have my own website, nancyatkinson.com, where you can, uh, I'm going to be posting some kind of behind the scenes stories of me writing the book and the places I went to pretty soon. So look for that. And of course, you can find the book on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Wonderful. Uh, so another reminder, if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe. And if you want to be able to see when we do these shows live, make sure you click on the little notification bell because then your phone will freak out when we're when, when we've gone live. Do that with this. And also, if you want to watch Astronomy Cast live, you should uh, do that with the Astronomy Cast channel as well. Uh, well, once again, it's been a total honor to, deal, to, uh, to be here to bring the space every week. Uh, and now we will see you all next year. Yeah, See happy new later. year. Happy, happy new, new year. year. Let me get the the pretty bunch of you. There we go. Say goodbye everybody. Yay. Bye. All right. See you later. <laughs>